Good morning. All right, let's dive right in. I, so I'm not ready to show you all the rope, but I did bring the rope, and I've been talking about the rope for three weeks. But um, I want to expand on Ecclesiastes. We've been, we've been camped out on Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and we've been talking about Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes that Solomon wrote. It was for future generations, and it was kind of not, not like a warning, but it's kind of like, listen, this is, these are the things that we should focus on, and these are the things that we shouldn't focus on. And, and Solomon is, was given such great foresight to see all these different things, and he was given great knowledge and, and wisdom to write these things for us and, and future generations and us now, and thousands and hundreds of years removed from that day that he wrote these words, and it still means something. But I want to give you more than what two is better than one. I want to show you, and I'm going to read, and this isn't actually up here, so when I get to verses 9 through 12, I'll throw it up there for you, but I want to give you the first part of chapter 4 and why he is saying these words, that two are better than one. Because I want you to understand that as we've been talking about these bonds and our relationships, and we talked at first our relationship with him, and then last week we talked about our relationship with us, as a church and what we should be doing. Today we're gonna to focus with our, our, our bond to another. There are some relationships that have been designed and created for us to be attached to, whether it be our spouses or a best friend or a close relationship or a mentor, mentee, uh, whatever that may be. There are some relationships that we are designed and created for naturally to have and to foster and to build and to grow and, and, and to be connected to. And so, as we get there, I want you to hear what Solomon is saying and what Solomon is seeing. And I want you to see if there's any resemblance to what you see in our world right now. So chapter 4, four verse uh, 1, this is how it starts. Again, I looked and I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. Like he's looking at all the oppression that I see. I saw the tears of the oppressed and they have no comforter. Power was on their side, was on the side of their oppressors and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who, are all, who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been, who has not yet seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw that all the labor and all the achievement spring up from men's envy of his neighbor. This too is meaningless and chasing after the wind. The, fools, the fool folds his hand and ruins himself. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with, uh, handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. And again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end in his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless and a miserable business. And then Solomon closes that out by saying, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. He is talking about a world, looking at even in ancient Israel, he is looking out and they are oppressed, they are lonely, life is meaningless. And he's talking about from the eyes of a wealthy man, it's meaningless because he toils, but he has nobody to share it with. He is working for nothing. And I think oftentimes when we look out in, our, in, in this world, like we put so much into our professions, we should put so much into fruitless, uh, fruitless things that don't produce good fruit. And we waste so much time on things that really don't matter. I mean, yes, we all want to live comfortably. And some of us have, have an abundance of this and some of us don't. But there's an appreciation for the, like if you really started evaluating your life based off the relationships that you had, then there's something that you truly are rich. I mean, think about it. Uh, Pastor Mike used to say it all the time. And I wish it was way before my time at Rock Spring, but I wish I would have seen the sermon. But like you can't, there's, there's no trailer behind a, uh, behind a hearse. You can't take it with you. And that's so true. So why are we 
you know, toiling away. I was, I was, I was with some friends last night. It was so cool, and and one of the, the set of friends was talking about their parents who were out buying some expensive cars. And I, it was a joke. We were laughing back and forth, and, and 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 they have worked all their life and worked hard. So I'm not saying go out and spend your money. I'm not saying that. But now they're at that point in their life where they are gifting their family and and doing these different things. It's like whoa. But it's like listening to them talk about their parents. It was like. They, they said, like, I'm finally glad, like, they're at a point in their life where they just want to go out and do, like, do things. And it, it led to a whole conversation. Uh, I was listening to a sermon earlier this week. They stop buying gifts for your kids. Stop stressing about what you're, what you're putting in with by that birthday cake or under that Christmas tree. Start, start spending money in experiences because experiences are what your children are going to remember. You know, and it's like, that's really cool. I'm not, and not saying I would not buy a thing like a small gift or something like that, but our children will talk more about going to the beach or going here or going there or that Disney World trip they'll talk about forever. And, and you know, those are the things, those are experiences. And all those experiences build relationships. And, and not even just with us as parents watching our kids. Like, I'll never forget, like, the coolest thing. Um, um, when I had my worst moment there, like watching my oldest son disappointed. I mean, he's 18, 19, 19 when we were there, 19, 20, 20. Why, why we were down there, like he's a grown man, like he's down there doing his own thing. But like he was with his brothers. And, like, and I kept telling him, go, go do your own thing. If you want to, don't feel obligated to get on the slinky ride again if you don't want to. <laughs> you know. But his response to me, which I so appreciate from a 19-year-old young man, was like, we're here as a family dad like if I go off we're like we're supposed to be together and I'm like okay guess you're getting on the slinky ride again for the second time you know because that's the one the boys like but those things are what build relationships and it's not just the intimacies of our our family units but think about the relationships you have at home if we started looking at it again if we go back to week one and you talk about having that bond with God and God is like that primary bond like that 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 bond right there is number one and you will start realizing that nothing happens on accident. Everything is, is purposeful. I busted my chin open on Friday. Um, I wish I could tell you it was a glorified, awesome fist fight, although I don't want any fights at school, so if students are watching this later, I don't want that. But I have nothing glorifying to say. It was the most embarrassing thing. I was competing in a relay race, and uh, I dove on the scooter. We still have old school scooters. I was really happy with that. I thought we got rid of all those things. And I smacked my chin, and my chin didn't bounce off the... It did bounce, but it left a nice little imprint. Um, but I look at that, and even though it hurt, and I had to go get stitches... Listen, I got to go sit with my mom for an hour. My mom, the week prior, had come to see us on the Sunday. And typically, we don't do anything on Sunday. My mom's sitting on our porch and took a picture. And my mom's a, a working mom, and she's always gone. And like, now I got, to, I got to spend an hour with my mom because she was working and came down to make sure her baby was okay. <laughs> and, uh, and because my wife ratted me out and told her I was at the hospital. Uh, but I got to spend time with her. And then also while I was there, talk about relationships and how this stuff plays into it. While I was there, I haven't seen a woman that I, that I used to work with if, through the probation office. Haven't seen her in probably 10 years. Had no idea she's working in the hospital. She knocked on my door, came in, said, you know, they have to wear the mask and stuff. So I didn't recognize her. And it was one of those moments. She caught me in a lie too. I just might as well confess that. She came in and she goes, hi. And I was like, hey. And she goes, do you know who I am? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> and then she took the mask off and it was a dear friend that I have not seen in over 10 years. And like, it was just amazing that here God pumped the brakes on me, busted open my chin, has me in the hospital. I'm getting stitches with the nicest doctor there and then staff. It was just really cool. But then I got to sit with my mother and I got to see somebody I hadn't seen in, in 10 some years. And and uh, it was just the coolest thing, and all because of busting my chin up and, and thinking about relationships that I have. You know, I got to be with my mother, and then I, I got to see a friend who thought enough of me to still come in there to, to come talk to me and seek me out when I got there. It was just, you can never minimize the relationships that we have. Two are better than one. And often we go into issues and struggles and we feel like we got to fight it alone. Like we go in unarmed to fight the enemy because it's my battle, I'll do it by myself. And that is not the way that God intended it. 
God intended his church to be an army. And God designed us to have suitable partners. God, and even, and, I, and this is not a marriage talk. Like I'm going to give you Genesis and how we are created to have suitable partners. But this is not a marriage talk. Because even you don't have to be married to have a suitable partner. We have best friends, partnerships. I got friends that I will call that I rely on. I hope everybody does. I got certain friends that I will call for, for specific information. Then I got friends that I know I'm not calling that guy for, for that one because that's, that's, a, that's a Bob question. I got to call Bob. You know, or I got spiritual mentors that I'll call that I have an expectation that their accountability over me and will speak truth to me. You know, and then of course I have my, my family that, you know, will speak a different side. You know, we have those relationships, but the idea and the key is that we are meant for that. Talking about Jackson's rope, this is that rope I've been talking about. Like this legitimately was, the, this was a, a gift and I'd say that it's a gift that keeps giving and it's an experience. Um, we have lots of experiences with this rope. Typically it's in a lasso format and so that he can tie it on things. But the idea is think about that. This is a whole bunch of strands of string together. The one strand is definitely weak. If we had one strand, we could cut it. We could probably tear it. And more than likely, you could probably pull it apart. You can't do that with this. And it's funny, as Jackson was headed out, he was talking, well, you know, if it gets, if it gets knotted up or whatnot, it weakens it, which we talked about. But, I mean, this is the idea of what we're talking about, that together we are stronger. You know, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be hard. That doesn't mean that when you do tie this around something that there isn't going to be friction. It's not going to, it's going to get hot every now and then. Um, it's going to go through its bumps and its bruises, but yet it is still, you, we are still stronger together. And, and, it, and I, I would be, I have to say this, that relationships suck. We, we've said it last week, they're terrible, they hurt. I mean, the, the relationships, and, 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 and despite that, he still says, go make relationships. He challenged each, each and every one of us to go make disciples. If you believe in me, then go share who I am. If you love me, then go love what I love. And he loves people. And so we go out because that is the command, and we believe in him, and he tells us to go do it. And, and because we believe in him, it equip, he, we know that he equips us. He equips us to meet this resistance, because you're gonna meet it. Relationships suck, they're terrible, they hurt. Even the close ones, even the bonds, even marriage relationships suck at times. They're terrible, it hurts. Mine's great, my wife's amazing. But we still have problems, we still got issues. We're not absent of it. You know, like when you choose to be married, the enemy just absolutely loves to get into that. Like he loves to throw sticks and stones and, and, and he loves to throw anything and everything at a marriage relationship because if I can tear that apart, I can, I can fracture a whole lot of relationships because you tear one marriage apart, you hurt a whole bunch of kids. You hurt those kids, it flows over into other people. You, you tear, you, a lot, oftentimes we get selfish in our relationships, our marriage bonds, because we think that, that oh, it's just us. Like if we choose to break apart, it's just us. Well, what about my children? What about her family? What about my family? What about all the changes that have happened over the past 15 years? You know what I mean? Like we selfishly think about that, but, but the relationships hurt. They let us down. They betray us. They, they, they steal from us. They require a lot. I mean, relationships, good bonds that you have require a lot of constant work and massaging. They're exhausting. For those of you that teach young children, oh my gosh, I can only imagine. Teenagers are exhausting. I don't want to... I got to listen to Shelly and Willie talk about Hannah's first week and just some of the frustration, not frustrations, but just... Um, Concerns like uh, the Willie was telling me or Shelly was telling me about getting her small children onto a bus. Like I can only imagine the anxiety that is for a, a kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher, second grade teacher to make sure that. Because listen, I'm the parent on the other end waiting to get my kid back. So I hope you put them on the right bus. You know, and, and and we had that. We were worried that the boys could get on a new bus would get on the wrong. Like Carrie asked because when we were up in South Berkeley. Um, our boys first day they always put like when they're kindergarten they had the little lanyards and they had their little thing like Carrie was like well where's their lanyard like why don't we have a lanyard so they know what bus they're getting on you know and poor Jackson Ashley they don't know this this bus you know but they our children got on and got back to us but 
listening to uh, Shelly talk about that, that, uh, that Hannah was experiencing some troubles getting students on the right bus, I can only imagine, because here these little people are looking at you, even on day one, you are starting to build that relationship with these little people that are just like looking at you. And if you think I'm wrong, wait, like for new teachers, wait till you're in the grocery store and people, they see you and they're like, <laughs> like they look at you like you're a superhero. Like it is the cool, like uh, our kids saw their bus driver and like went crazy and it's only been week one. Like they ran up their bus driver. Uh, they saw their teacher too. We saw their teacher. Asher saw his teacher. I got to meet his teacher at the fair because I didn't get to go to teacher night. Um, it's so cool. Uh, that's the that is the relation. That, that's only one week into the school year, and you've already started building a bond, building relationships, uh, and doing things like that. Like I sat in the dunk tank even after I split my, my chin open, and, and on Friday for the softball girls, and it was awesome. But like kids lining up and screaming, "Sarge!" are coming in and dunking me, and then. Uh, cheating the system at times too for those of you that cheated <laughs> and couldn't hit the target but still decided to run up and hit the thing and, and dunk me but that's what it's that's how it starts and God has challenged us all to do that to go and make disciples and 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 to build those relationships and what if I could add to to us in education or anybody is people don't care what you know until they know that you care I've heard that repeated so many times and I wish I could say that to every teacher because I do believe that they're not teachers. I don't want to focus. It's just the, the environment that I get to work on. Because like that, as a parent, I think you can talk this much. But until your children actually really know that you care, it's just you wonder sometimes why our children are not receptive to what we're saying because we haven't even planted the seed that we even care about it yet. you know, Or sacrificed our time to care about what they care about. I say that a lot with our high schoolers. It's like, listen, you want them to respond to you? Then go to the stuff that they like. Go to their game. You see a kid that sees you at their game, whew, that's a huge response when they see you at something that they care about. You start investing your time in them, they will give you more in the classroom. I believe that full heartedly. Um, but we're better together. And that's the way God designed us. God designed us. Uh, designed it, 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 us. Designed us that way. We bond to Him. We got that rope. We're connected to Him. We bond to Him. We bond to us. Talking to talking about us as the church. Us as you know, the church is more than just this physical structure. The church is supposed to be a network of relationships from the top down. Doesn't mean just got to be a pastor or a deacon or a chaplain or uh, a priest. Or does not matter. And matter of fact. Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, it do, we should all be interconnected together because we serve one God. Like it's a network of churches. Like again, why I love this ministry, like we go serve at other churches that are doing events because it's a network. We're supposed to be bonded together and building relationships because the gates of hell will not overcome heaven. It will not overcome God's kingdom because we're a network of like-minded folks that love him first. And don't forget that he loved you first. And so we bond together. That's what the importance of the church. We hear lots of folks say, I don't need the church. I got my Bible. I read at home. That's good. But you need the church. Because the church is every last one of us together. I need to know what you know. And you need to know what I know. And we need, listen, you got more than, than I got. Or they, we, we are in this together. And that is huge. And then I would put into this, a bond to another. Let me talk about the marriage relationship for a second. That bonding to another. Th this is the order it should go. If you agree with me, agree with me. If you don't, you die. That's fine. A lot of us get it wrong, including myself, that we didn't get this bond right. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you did get that bond right, but then you, moved, you, you skipped over that bond. And you went into this bond. And then you talk about that unequally yoked. And you talk about how there's so much... Can it work? Yes, it can work. I'm not saying that while well, you're destined for divorce if you cut all that out. What I'm saying is you can overcome a lot more struggles if you're in this first. Because this gives you a strong foundation. This gives you identity. He gives you identity. This gives you a great foundation to help support that. Because this is hard. When you commit to a marriage relationship, when you can commit to a, a mentor relationship, again, talking about other relationships, when you commit to a one-on-one -on -one relationship, it gets hard because that's when it gets intimate. 
again talking about the marriage relationship i mean the marriage relationship there's so many things that can go wrong there again that is the example that god uses describing his church he describes it as a marriage describes it i will come back for my bride we are his bride he, he uses that that's the great uh, historical biblical example that god uses to describe his church is is a, is a marriage relationship but you've got to, we've got to move in this, in this order. First him, then us, and then another. I do better with my wife when I'm good with this. We were able to salvage our marriage because of this. But man, if, what if we had started here, then moved here? Maybe half the hardships that we experienced would never ever happen because it would have changed how we viewed one another, how we valued one another. Do you believe that this changes how we value other people? He changes it radically. This should change it even more too. Should strengthen what this is and affirm what he says and continue to challenge us to build relationships with people that we don't understand. This is not about exclusive uh, being uh, um, exclusively uh, like our ideas and this and that. This should be inclusive. We should be challenging each other as a network, as a church, to go meet people that aren't like us, to go do things that are different and outside the norm, to go, to go greet and not be ashamed or afraid to hide or, or even to go out and be like, listen, yeah, I struggled with that for years and have the confidence. So the one song we listen to, there is no shame. What does it say? Uh, um, um, I'm trying to think of the words. Uh, uh, tell hell to go to hell. You know, like I, I like that. And then there's no shame. There, you know, like, listen, that's what it should be. And if I could get that right and have those bonds and those connections and those people, then I can move into this relationship strengthened and ready. Because God says it is not suitable for you to be alone. So don't tell me that it, I'm just a loner. I just want to be alone. We wonder why we have so many depression issues, anxiety issues, struggles, and, and stuff like that. Because people, we are so private. We are so, I'm not telling you that I need to know everything about you. What I am telling you is there's somebody out there for you. There's somebody out there that is prepped and prepared to hear you, to listen. Who's been there? Who's had that struggle? This world is filled with billions of people. There is somebody out there. And if, I, I, I'm sorry I keep transitioning and saying this because I don't. this is not a marriage talk. There is somebody that's dealt with that addiction. There is somebody that has dealt with infertility. There is somebody who has dealt with the loss of, some, uh, of a family. There is somebody out there for each and every one of us to connect to, to bind to, 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 to be with. There are suitable partners. And, and it's not suitable for us to be alone. Because alone, I don't know about you, alone I'm destructive. So it's either this, alone I'm lazy. That's definitely one of my, like if you leave me alone, I'm lazy. I'm taking a nap. Uh, I'm taking a nap or I'm gaming all day if you leave me alone. That's just, just being completely honest. But if my wife's home, I feel motivated to do different things. I feel motivated to, to go be with her. If my children are home, so I get motivated to, to be with them. You know, uh, but if you're in a poor state, if in poor physical, emotional health and you're alone, that just helps me feel more sorry for myself. Helps me keep digging a hole even deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. <clears throat> I mean, us as men, we're taught all the time not to talk about our feelings. That's why God makes me cry all the daggone time. That's revenge, God. <laughs> Vengeful God. He makes me cry. I used to be ashamed of it, but now, like, because for so long, all I did was I kept everything inside. There's still more in here. I've talked about a lot of it, um, and I have good people that I've spoken with, but like, I think that those, that is a, uh, a transition for years of keeping that stuff buried and not talking and not, that's not what he wants for us. He doesn't. He wants you to be a talker. He wants you to have relationships. He, again, tells us it is not good for us, especially us men. We're not built to be alone. Statistically, if you looked at it, if you went through a divorce, statistically, men will find somebody within the first year. Look up the statistics. It's really, I think it was like, last I looked, it was like 60, 67, 68% of the time. A woman can go on for, for a while. That's right. <laughs> I'm just going to say what it is. We're weaker. We are weaker. We uh, were built to bond. We all are. 
But us men, we definitely struggle with it. That's just a sidebar on that. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. There was nobody in creation when God created everything that was suitable for Adam, a suitable partner for him to have. And God realized that. God was like, he needs somebody. He needs somebody to have, to talk to, to be with, not just God. Because like he had God, but God said he needs a suitable partner. So the Lord caused the man to fall asleep in a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from that rib and he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, and the man said, this is my bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. What I want you to get out of that the most is they felt no shame. They were one flesh and they felt no shame. There should be no shame in your relationship with another. You hear that? In the marriage one specifically, but also in any relationships. God does not want you to feel shame. He doesn't want you to be ashamed. He doesn't want you to walk around wounded and hurt all the time. Yes, you're going to be wounded and you're going to be hurt, but he's equipped you to move past that and, and, and get through it. There is no shame. You know what? You screwed up. It's okay. Let's go on. See, what happens is we get stuck in the past. And half the time you think she's judging you and she isn't even judging you. She's waiting for you to come back. But you're so ashamed of what you did that you won't even bridge that gap anymore. So you quit on the relationship and you moved on. While that person is sitting there going, what happened? This is because we brought shame into the relationship. We don't operate on this idea of oneness. Now, I know that this right here specifically is talking about Adam and Eve and the oneness of the relationship, and they become one flesh as a husband and wife should. That's the way God designed it. But he also, and then he says there should be no shame. But the oneness is a big thing for all of us because is it not just one church? It's all of us. It's not Covenant Baptist, it's not Crossroads, it's not Asbury, it's not Focus, it's not Rock Spring, it's not Airborne, it's, it's one church. In the end, it's not going to be which, church, which one of us is greater, which one of us is better. No, we all going together. It's going to be one big block party. You know, I mean, that's ultimately what it is. And to bring, to, to, to keep us from experiencing that because we have shame. Like how many, don't write it, but how many have for so long never went in church because you were ashamed? The most intimate encounter I ever had with God is when I was hung over and I snuck into church and I sat in the back pew. Literally got off my mother's couch and wore the same daggone clothes I was wearing the night before and walked into the back pew of a church. No shame. Now, I'm not telling you that there were perfect Christians in that church that were probably not looking at me and going, what in the world? Like, God smells like cigarettes. I think he's probably still drunk. But I felt no shame at that point because I knew what I needed. That's what we, that, that is what God wants for us. That is what you should be seeking when you are going out to make disciples. That, that should be the goal. It shouldn't be anything stopping you. Like sometimes it's not even shame. Sometimes it's just apprehension. You're afraid that they'll be rejected. It's not on you to be rejected. That's on them. If that person doesn't receive it, that's okay. Because you did what God equipped you to do. And you did it out of love. As long as you aren't coming out as a, like throwing down the hammer and the gauntlets and you're wrong, that's not appropriate. That is not evangelism. That is not, that is not Christ-centered. That is not what God wants from his church. There are moments, and I, 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 will, tell, I will tell that to the guy on the side, on the corner that's out here screaming at people and, and arguing at people. That is not evangelism. That's not evangelism. That is not what Jesus did. Jesus did not speak to, to non-believers like that. Jesus did not speak to a community like that. Jesus spoke to religious people like that. There's a difference. He wasn't evangelizing religious people. He was correcting them. And scripture gives us bold statements on how we deal with one another. 
how we are to deal with a brother and sister in Christ who have already received Christ and how we are to deal with somebody that doesn't know who Jesus is. It is completely, radically different and we confuse it and we say that it's evangelism. It is not evangelism. I love that man. I think it's great. I pray for him every time I pass him. But he's not helping God's kingdom. He's harming it. But he's, he's, he's got a misunderstanding of that. And I don't want, to, again, going back to that, I'm not just talking about our relationships uh, in the marriage sense. I mean, Paul, the greatest apostle, was not married. Matter of fact, he said, I wish more of you could be like me. Marriages tie us down. They shackle us down. They don't let us watch what we want to watch. We don't get to go do what we want to do all the time. I got to share my money. I got to share my food. Especially, you know, like, it's terrible. Paul said, I wish you could be like me. And just go. But that doesn't mean that Paul didn't have relationships and people he invested in. Paul had Timothy. Paul had Silas. Paul had Aquila. Paul had uh, uh, Mark and John and, uh, and Priscilla. Like he, his, his letters are to people that he built relationships with. His letters to, are to the Corinthian church, the church at Ephesus. He, is, he has built relationships with people. Just because he chose not to be married doesn't mean he was lacking in relationships. He had people. He had lots of them. And those are just a few that I mentioned that he invested in. I mean, Timothy being one of the greatest that he pulled along and, and spoke, in a lot, uh, spoke a, a, a lot of life into. We see his name mentioned a lot in the letters. But he had those bonds with people. He had that oneness with other people. A oneness that centered not on an intimate, uh, intimate sexual relationship, but in intimacy centered on God and sharing the gospel and just being a good human being. That's who Paul was. And Paul was ridiculed. Paul was beaten. Paul was jailed. Paul was, was uh, uh, ridden out of places. Paul was, the stones were thrown at him. Paul was beaten. Paul was bruised. Paul, Paul was lied on. People stole from him. But Paul still loved people. He loved what God loved. And so it didn't stop him from going out and making those relationships and being one with other people. And so oneness, and oneness is like the complete, is, it completes us. We're not meant to be alone. I mean, it is, it's, it's that oneness that, that binds us together, that, that creates this rope. This rope is probably the best gift we have ever purchased in our house. Um, it is also, in the same token, terrible because like it... it, it my banisters probably aren't going to last much longer because the boys keep getting heavier. But like, when you think of the relationships that you build in your life and being one and being like this, this is what makes us stronger. Because when I have an off day, she picks me up. When she has an off day, I come back and snap her out of it. I mean, that's what we do relationships I have at work. I've built really close relationships with the folks that I work with. I spend a lot of time with those people. I mean, a lot of time with those people. You know, uh, 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 my principal, Mary Beth, like she's, I, our relationship's grown. Like she hated me when I first got there because I think she misunderstood me. But like we've grown and like there's a relationship. And like our, our admin team, like we have built, we, we built a strong team. And send a strong message because we rely on one another that despite the hardships that education brings, we're not breaking. We're not breaking. We're, we're together in this. You see in some places when there are cuts and there are knots, when things start going wrong and you see the finger pointing and the shaming and the frustration. But if you can just get back to this, it goes all right, right? And I, and I wanted to... I, I, I was thinking about this too. If you think about oneness and you think about the idea of this rope and it being that and it use the concept of a cord and a rope, think about it this way. If you are in a relationship and you have relationships like this, this is another set of toys that we have at our house. I, what kind of parent are we? Like, <laughs> this is your idea. I know, but like it was my idea. I'll take, listen, you just real quick tell you that I decided to get a long cord uh, rope for my son and I bought him carabiners. You know, like, I want the imagination to be broad and, and expansive. But, like, think about it this way. The idea of using this rope and you're, you're mountain climbing or something, but you have these carabiners that keep you hooked to it. Think about every relationship. You've got these relationships. That's what, these, that's what this is. 
You know, as you start to slip off or fall off or fall apart or whatnot, somebody comes right along and clips you back in, anchors you back into where you're supposed to be, back in there. And, and I was looking for, we have a really big carabiner because I wanted everybody to see it like this carabiner. I couldn't find it. And as I was getting frustrated this morning, I was late for church and I was sitting there, I couldn't find the big set that we have. God sat there and told me, I'm telling you, this, these are the, this is how you have to get in your relationship with God. God said, guess, guess, guess what, Ben? Size doesn't matter, just take the small ones. Sometimes even the littlest relationships are what keep you connected to Him. That prompt of a phone call, busting my chin open and getting to see my mom, seeing a relationship I haven't seen in 12 years. It's not a, it's not a relationship where she, the, the, this, this, the, this individual and I go and have dinner or, or do her thing, but it's just, it was a work relationship, but a bond that we had created almost 12 years ago. You know, to still have that. You know, who knows? That, that phone call you made to that, to that friend of yours that at the right time, where they were questioning their value, questioning their purpose and you were the person that called them and anchored them right back into that back into that oneness I mean think about that we have so much power and our power is drawn with from from within in our relationships because God gives you the strength to do that and he challenges you to go out and do it and build those relationships and use your relationships to strengthen one another, not tear each other down. And sometimes it is the smallest, littlest thing that gets it all back, back in place and keeps you back on there. I know there are people, like when I start getting rocked, I know who I'm calling. I know who I need to speak to. I know who's gonna call me out. I know who's gonna keep me accountable. I know that um, even if it's just a text message, man, we, God, you can't make it any easier for us to communicate with one another. <laughs> we, we were talking to the boys the other day, like uh, we played the dial tone for like the old AOL, like getting on the internet. <laughs> and the kids were like, what is that? <laughs> and I was like, that's how you got on the internet back in the day. <laughs> and then I said, and I said, guess what? If you were on the internet and all of a sudden I picked up the house phone, you're off the internet now. <laughs> and our... Jax's face was hysterical. He was like, what? It was, it was so crazy. But like, you can't make it any easier to communicate with one another. To be that little clip for somebody to get them back in connection. Like you, we may be, because I mean, along with the technology that we have, it's also it allowed us to extend ourselves and move far away. But you know, because my siblings, I have one, my oldest sister lives in Texas and I should be a better, I am a terrible communicator. Let me just straight up tell you that right now. I'm terrible. I don't like talking on the phone. Um, I'm better at text messages. Um, uh, I'm spotty with email. Um, I'm just terrible, and I got to get better at it. But to my siblings, I apologize because my siblings are great with it. They stay connected to my mother. They, 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 you know, I'm the closest one to my mom, and I don't get to see her as much. But my siblings know everything that's happened in my mother's daily life. Like they, they're great. And they were awesome with that. And, you know, unfortunately, it takes God making me, allowing me to bust my chin on a gym floor that gets me in the room of my mother. This is shameful. And I'm telling you that because maybe there are relationships that you need to be drawn to. My grandmother likes written letters. I write letters to my grandmother. She would prefer to have a written letter from me than to have me send her an email. You know, think about all the different things of communication and relationships that we have. It, you know... We should not give the enemy time to tear us down, to break us apart, to get in between. And, he, and again, God equips us for all of that. And I wanted to share 1 Corinthians 13. You've heard this, even if you're not a Christian and you haven't been a Christian or, or you've been to a wedding. I know you've heard this because we misuse this so much. And I love going to weddings and, or, and they ask this to be part of it. I'm like, oh, I need you to understand what God's really saying right here. You know, and a lot of folks misunderstand it. But let me, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, always preserves, love never fails. See, he equips us to love equips us to love. 
You could go down the range of this right now and think, well, you know what? My love's pushed me to anger at times. Love of something. Uh, it's pushed my wife love of food to, to, to be angry. It's, it's tested our patience. It's um, how many times have you been envious of another relationship? Mm-hmm. Another relationship that you looked at and, you know, I wish I, wish, I wish that was us. I wish I could have done that. I wish I could have been that. How, how, many, how many times like, like you find yourself boasting? God's had to humble me and humiliate me a lot of times in my life because I know why God didn't make me a rock star because I just know from my natural ability, like, the, like my natural in brain, like I'd probably be like crazy. So God didn't make me, I, I still wish I was a rock star, but God said, you're not gonna be a rock star. You know, learn things about yourself. It doesn't dishonor. Like love should be, love is sacrificial. That's what it is. That honestly is what it is. And that's what they're saying right here is in this intimate relationship, she is first. Like everything I love has to be, like it's got to be surrendered. Everything to, 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 to Jacob because he's my friend. I, I, I got to surrender that. That's a relationship. I've known Jacob since he was a child. It's a bond. It, it is something that we sacrifice. It is something we give up. And God equips us to do all those things because how, how else can I be married to my spouse and, and spouse and be patient and kind and not, and not envious of somebody else as we get older, right? You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that, babe. You're getting beautiful the older you get. But you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, you're heading that out. Think about it, though. It do, it's not. It does not dishonor. It's not self-seeking. It's 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 not easily angered. It doesn't mean because you love, you're not going to ever get angry. What I'm saying is, God equips us to do all this. God equips us to love despite ourselves, despite who we are, despite all the nastiness. God makes it possible. He makes love possible because He's love. God is love. He did all this for us. He did all of that for us. He did it before we even got on this planet. He knew our hairs on our heads before we were even born. He knew what you did yesterday before you even did it or thought about it. He knows what you're going to do this afternoon at 3 o'clock. He knew the decision. He knew the lie you were going to say. He knew when you were going to get angry this year at work. He already knows. He knows the day. He knows the time. He knows when you're going to flip out. He knows the curse word you're going to say. He knows what you're going to look at. And when you look at that relationship and how angry you're going to get at your supervisor or boss, he knows that even though you didn't say it, you really thought about putting your hands around their neck and choking them out. God knows all those things. I mean, I'm just trying to make it personal because we all have those feelings. And we think just because we didn't act on it, it's okay. And it's not. Because we have to value the relationships all the time, every time. Because he did it for us first. This can never be broken. It can never be broken. Like when I look at young folks and how quickly they are to, some people pride themselves on how they can cut relationships off and move on. That's not what God intended for us. God didn't create a whole bunch of quitters. God created, I mean, the human body and the human spirit is so resilient. I mean, back us into a corner, we'll fight. I was teaching an active shooter class uh, for the county and um, got to hear a speaker not too long ago, but like they talked about (coughs) the percentages of folks out there that would harm people or whatnot. And you know, there's only 2% of people that would actually harm people. One for good and one for bad. And the majority of society would never, ever harm anybody. But then there's that exception. You back somebody into a corner, a mama bear into a corner, she won't fight. Like, I think if you back any of us into a corner who are strengthened by him and have a focus on the relationships in our life, then we're going to fight. Because I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. It's easy to say that about your spouse. Well used to be it's not anymore I mean divorce is skyrocketed and and terrible right now but how about your kids I'll never quit on my kid right we will a lot of us will fight for our children hell I said hell sorry (laughs) just getting honest let's just be honest a lot of us would sacrifice our our marriage relationship for our kids and that's not what he designed it for I always tell my boys they'll tell you it was she and I before it was us and you. <laughs> yeah, I remind my boys of that all the time. You know, but a lot of us will sacrifice that relationship for our children. And that's not healthy either. 
because now I'm raising children to do the same thing. And that's not what he wants. What I'm saying is, it should never be easy to quit this. It should never. This should never break. And if you're talking about that vertical relationship with him, it can never be broken. The only person that can break that is you because he won't break it. He will pursue, he will chase, he will come after, he will forgive, he will wipe clean, he will, he will heal, he will do whatever he can take and whatever he can do to make sure that he stays connected to you. It is you that decides to break it. It is you that decides to walk away from it. He makes all of this possible. He makes it all possible. In the, in the, in the letter to the Colossian church, I love what is said here. It says, all, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. All these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Our bonds should be wrapped up in love. It's just, it's just the way it is. We should be, our desire from with him, to be connected with him, unity with him, unity with the church, and unity with each other. Whether, again, whether you're married or not, we're in it together. That is what we're, he, that's what God called us to do. To not let anything bind us to the past, but let our love bind us to our bonds and our relationships. Let all that be wrapped up together. And that's what it's got to be. And that's why the church needs to be the leading factor in that. It's got to be the leading factor in that. It's got to help start establishing foundations in our communities to help establishing healthy relationships to keep moving forward instead of moving backwards. To, and, uh, instead of meeting brick walls, we need to be open arms and, and, and welcoming and, and bringing people in and teaching healthy relationships. Rejection teaches nothing. I, 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 when we reject people, we turn people away. Rejection teaches nothing. It just hurts and humiliates. I don't want to be rejected by him. And he would never do that to me. And I know that because I believe. And that's what he wants for us. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this series that you've brought to us. To not let the, the sins of our past bind us to our past, but that you have a glorious future for all of us. That you have relationships that you want restored. You have relationships that you want strengthened. You want the bonds of our life to be so strong, Father. And Father, you have equipped us. For those of us that believe, you've equipped us to overcome all of that stuff. All of the mess, all of the arguments, all of the fights, all of the battles that we face on a daily basis. Father, whatever cracks we have in our exterior, Father, I pray that you can fill it with mortar and strengthen us up to cast out the enemy, to tell him he can't have a foothold here. Father, let us be leading the charge and building relationships with one another and with our community. Father, for those of us that need to strengthen our relationship with you, Father, I pray that we dig inside for that, that we start reflecting on who we are and whose we are, that you created us, that you know us and you want to know us even more, that you are coming back for us. Father, I pray for those right now that might be questioning that, that don't understand that, that the magnitude of your love for them is greater than anything they could have ever done or ever will do. You just want them to come to you. And Father, for the church, for the church, I pray that we can rise up in unity, strengthen our, our bonds, create networks, build relationships, open our doors, cast out stigmas and, and false falseness of what the church truly is. Father, help this ministry keep set its footprint in this community by being that, by setting the example, by working with others. And Father, for those that are the married in the room, for those that have strong relationships with another, maybe a mental relationship, specifically our teachers. Father, I pray for those relationships and the importance of those relationships and the intimacy of those relationships. I pray for your grace and your mercy to, to flow over each and every one of those relationships to help us look, the, uh, to look past the wrongs and some of the frustrations that might cloud our, our decisions and our judgments. But Father, to, to, to help us see through that, and to strengthen them and push forward. Father, you are amazing and you've done all of this for us. And we thank you for that. And help us do it for another. Father God, we love you, we serve you, and we praise you. 
in Jesus' name, amen.